Uh, it's been a, a few weeks now that, you know, different people have just uh, approached me in, re in regards to this particular day. This is May, May 20th, um, because today there's a phenomena that's going on um, in the heavenly places, uh, like the moon. <laughs> if you're not aware of it, by now, tonight is Friday, March 20th. And um, when there is also a solar eclipse that is taking place, it's not visible uh, to most people in the world because it's actually taking place in the north, um, specifically in the North Pole. And it is um, possible that uh, Europe, part of Europe, like England, will be able to actually see this eclipse that is unfolding or has already unfolded. So this uh, reminds me of the scriptures, in the last days I shall do a new thing. God's doing a new thing. And it's going to spring forth according to God's word. And it says, shall you not understand it? So there's things that are springing forth very quickly, very fast. Today is one of those days. And most people are not even aware that this particular day is very significant. It's huge. It's bigger than big. All right? So it turns um, this actually is like a new moon. And this new moon... Um, appears uh, 14 hours after what is known as lunar pre-regi. Uh, or uh, in other words, it's the time that the moon comes the closest to, to Earth in its orbit. And so the moon becomes very huge because it comes really, really close. Why is this so important? Well, this is the new moon and it is a super moon. It's so huge. It's called a supermoon at um, uh, having a larger than average or effect on the Earth's ocean as well. So it's actually having an effect in the oceans. Perhaps it's also having an effect on people at this particular time. Plus this new supermoon today in March 20 swung right in front of the equinox, it's called, um, the equinox sun, so that the moon's shadow falls on parts of the earth. So there are two equinoxes every single year. One of them is in March, and the other one is in September. And that is when the sun shines directly on the equator, and the length of days or nights are... Um, considered as nearly equal. So according to Jewish teaching, solar, equip, solar eclipse is a message from God. And let's, uh, let's, let's remember what I just said. What did I say? Solar eclipse are a message from God. Okay, because there's solar and there's lunar. All right, so the solar eclipse Eclipse is a message from God as a warning to the Gentiles. And it is also a sign of God's judgment on the nations. So today, tonight, March 20th, this is a sign from God to the nations of the world. The Gentiles, nations that don't know and serve God. It is a time that God is in effect saying to the nations, you are about to be judged. It's judgment on the nations. This is why this moon tonight is so important. Today there was a total eclipse and partial eclipse in certain parts of the earth. Mostly, as I said, in the northern part of the world. The Jewish people are taught that a total eclipse and partial eclipse in certain parts of the world speak also of what God is doing. Again, solar eclipse is a bad sign for the entire, the entire Gentile world. And so what kind of eclipse do we have today? A solar eclipse. 
And where is that solar eclipse taking place? In the north. Why in the north? No one can see it. No one lives there. And I, I kind of looked at this and I kind of was wondering, why, why is it taking place in a place that nobody could see it? Well, I think that there's a reason for that. And I think that it is because if God put this, the eclipse over a particular nation, then people were saying God is judging that nation. But because it's hidden and yet it's there, God is saying this is for the whole world. Are you following here? So it's not that you're going to point to that country or Russia or someone's going to point to the United States and say, yes, the solar came over America. God is going to judge America. No, it's there in the north. It's hiding. For God is saying there's judgment that's coming to the nations of the world. The Jewish people are well aware of the signs of the moon. They've known this for centuries, for hundreds and hundreds of years. So, so at this time, the Jewish people are, are being uh, told, or they're being taught again not to spend precious time in talking about the eclipses. Why? Because for thousands of years, they already have known what is to come. So if you know that something is coming, why talk about it all the time? What are they then encouraging them to do? He says, at this time, it is the time to pray for personal introspection. This is the time that the people of God begin the personal introspection because pretty soon, guess what they're going to do? They're going to be counting the Omar. Yes. And that is 30 days of personal introspection. So at this time, the introspection actually begins. Are you following this far? Yes. What do we mean by personal introspection? To look within in, within ourselves, in our innermost being, and, 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 and be honest with ourselves. Where have we been? Have we been trusting God or trusting in ourselves. In fact, there are those who have the custom to fast after seeing a lunar eclipse. That is the Jewish people because it is a sign that we really could, should, and should be doing better. The lunar e eclipse for the Jewish people is also not a good sign. It's a sign that, that um, the enemies of Israel are being stirred and maybe about to attack. The Jewish people along with the sages, the teachers of old, have all known for a very long time that eclipses are natural events that can be predicted. They already know what's going to happen. So the timing today of solar eclipse is especially significant. Why? Because it occurs just two weeks before the third blood moon and total lunar eclipse, which will occur when? April, April 4th, mm -hmm, the Jewish feast. Yes, Hawaii, maybe the third, yeah. But it's actually, you know, on the Jewish calendar, it's going to be on April 4th, the month of, of Nisan. So the earlier two blood moons occurred April 15th and October 8th, which also coincided with the Feast of what? Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles. The fourth blood moon in the Tetrad of four will appear on September 28th. Okay. On this year's Feast of Temples, or known as the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, so it is being called an exceeding rare solar eclipse because it's the final of four uh, red blood moons. So there was today a total eclipse of the sun for two minutes over the North Pole on this stage which coincides with the beginning of what? The Hebrew month of Nisan. Say the Hebrew month of Nisan. So it coincides at the very same time. This is the month that what took place, somebody know? 
the biblical calendar one of the Jewish people, a solar occurrence that is considered extremely rare in all of human history. Why is it being considered extremely rare? If it's considered extremely rare, then we might be able to consider that perhaps the finger of God is at hand right now. Just like the finger of God was in Mount Sinai, writing the tablets. It could very well be that the finger of God has moved today, this very day, May 20th. It is estimated, for example, that a total eclipse at the North Pole on the first day of spring, on the first day of the Jewish religious calendar, the month of, of Nisan, is an amazing thing. Now some have asked why is the eclipse taking place in the North Pole. I've explained that to you already. This solar eclipse is about a warning to all the Gentile nations of the world. It is said that such an ast astronomical event only takes place, listen, once every 100,000 years. So that's a long time waiting for today. <laughs> this is what makes this day so amazing. Whatever was going on 100,000 years ago with God and the angels of heaven, they were looking that about 100,000 years in the future, we're going to be right here. Yeah. And the time has arrived. And all the angels of heaven are saying, it's here right now today. Yeah. History is being made so the finger of God is pointing and drawing that the nations of the world are about to be judged. Are you listening here? It's very important for such an event to come our way after 100,000 years is something that we should not take lightly. And just hear about it and forget about it. For if indeed it means bad news for the unrighteous, and everybody has some unrighteous family member, it would be the right thing for us to pray for them. Judgment is coming. To pray for the unsaved world that they may come to the saving knowledge of God. Amen. Would you slip up your hands right now and let's offer a, a prayer in the mighty name of Yeshua. Our Father, we pray for the unsaved in this planet because we realize that judgment of God is at hand. We ask that the Holy Spirit that here right now in this planet will move forth through the face of this earth, convicting every man, every woman, young person, Lord, that they need a Savior. Touch them tonight, this day, all around this world, in the mighty name of Yeshua. And God's people say, Amen. Now, for a solar eclipse to occur on the first day of the first month of the biblical calendar year, celebrating the birth of the Jewish nation as they came out of Egypt after the Passover, listen, is entirely unprecedented. The eclipse will be in the North Pole, as I said, but expected to reach as far as Northern Europe. Now, this could mean that Europeans especially should take heed. This comes at a time when America or American aid for Israel has become an important political issue in the United States. It comes at a time also when Israel and the U.S. executive branch are at odds with each other. So God is looking to what decisions America is going to make because judgment is here now. I will bless those that bless you. But I will bring curses upon those that will curse Israel, saith the Lord. This is May 20th, the time that it begins. 
It also comes at a time when almost every single nation in the world is against Israel. But Israelis know they cannot put their survival in the hands of anyone who wishes their demise. For too long Israel has put their hopes in, in foreign aid and foreign help rather than trusting in the God of Israel. But in the speech of Benjamin Netanyahu to the U.S. Congress, he said, if Israel has to stand alone, it will stand alone, knowing that God, the God of Israel, will stand with Israel, even if no one else will. Yeah. Hallelujah. So Israel has learned their lesson. The final blood moon being called a super blood moon will appear during the Feast of Tabernacles this year, which is also known as a period of judgment for all the nations. The blood moon may set momentous world events in motion. The final red blood moon. So why is it that President, for example, Putin of, of, um, of Russia is flexing his military muscles these days? Why is it that he's conducting one of the biggest military maneuvers since World War II? As we sit here tonight, they are conducting the biggest military maneuvers. Could it be that they have developed a weapon as, it, as is being reported already? A weapon that is perhaps 100,000 times more powerful than any weapon man has ever seen? If that be so, and the United States of America and the other superpowers, or what powers may be, realize that they do have such a weapon, they will hold back and allow Russia to enter into Israel without no one lifting up a finger. And that's exactly what the Word of God says that Russia is going to do. Are you listening here tonight? This is why this day is so important. God is about to bring judgment to the nations of the world. The last time there were four blood moons in a row, it was 1967, Israel captured Jerusalem. The time before that occurred just after the reestablishment of Israel. Now, folks, Christians need to be aware of these facts in order to understand what is happening in the world today. That's why I'm sharing this message tonight. My thinking in all of this is that God in the last days is pointing the world to Israel. Yes. We are all on our way to Jerusalem. The eventual place where the Messiah is going to come. The Jewish people are the only people in the world that pray, listen, at least twice a day for the soon coming of the Messiah. Christians talk a lot about the end time or the end of days. The term end of days is taken actually from the Tanakh in the book of Numbers 24, 14. And now I am going to my people. I am going to my people. Come, I will advise you what this people will do to your people at the end of days. So that's where the term end of days actually began in the Tanakh. Now I want everyone here that has a Bible to turn to the book of Devarim in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 3. Because this is significant in the current world events that is taking place and what God is saying to the world. Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 1 to verse 3. It says, and it will be, when God says it's going to be, it's going to be. When all these things come upon you, the blessings and what? And the curses, which I have set before you, that you will consider in your heart. Among all the nations where the Lord your God had banished you. And you will return to the land. You will turn to the land, to the Lord your God, with all your heart and with all your soul, and you will listen. Do you hear this? They're going to listen to his voice. As they come back, they're listening to what voice? 
They're not listening to Washington, D.C. They're not listening to nobody else. It says there, you will listen to my voice, to his voice, according to all that I am commanding you this day, you and your children. Now, verse 3 says, then the Lord your God will bring you, will bring back your what? Exiles. Who's going to bring them back? It says, your God will bring back your exiles and he will have mercy upon you. He will once again gather you from all the nations where the Lord your God has dispersed you. And I know that most of you have heard that. But I want to emphasize something here really, really important that you need to key into. The Jewish people focus primarily here on verse 3. The Lord your God will bring you back, will bring back your ex exiles to mean the Lord your God will himself return with you. If you're going to bring someone, you are coming with that person, right? So it means that the Lord your God will himself return with your exiles. They are landing by plane, by boat, in any other means, and it is God, they're not landing alone. When you see a plane landing in Israel, coming from Ethiopia or from Russia, God says that I'm landing there with them at the very same time. Not just are the Jewish people returning, but the meaning to bring back implies coming back with God. They're coming back with God. And this alludes to the fact that God will respond to the daily cries because they pray at least two times a day. And what are they praying for? The return of the Messiah. That God will respond to the cries and the prayers of, of His people to come quickly. The prayer the Jews say each day, I believe in, in the soon coming of Mashiach. Yahweh has always or has also been waiting for such a time. So the Jewish people have pray this every day. They pray, I believe in the soon coming of the Mashiach, of the Messiah. Do you know that Yeshua himself or God himself has been waiting for these days to arrive? It is almost as he himself is being redeemed so that Israel does not return alone. But his very presence, his spirit returns along with Israel's exile before the Messiah comes. So what makes today the very first day of the month of Nisan most astounding? Commemorates the month in which God himself brought his people out of Egypt. And he himself guided them through the wilderness. And this is what the eclipse is about today also. The red blood moon coming out next month is a sign. It's a moadim. It's an appointed time when God is saying to the world, my presence is with my people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What is he saying? He says, it was I and no one else that brought them back to the land of, the, of their ancestors, which I gave them. It is I and I alone that am causing the sun and the moon to become a sign to the world of the soon coming of my son, the Messiah. For I have heard the cry and prayers of my people who cry to me day and night. And if this is all true, then we need to watch and pray for Israel, right? God's clock time for the world is Israel. <coughs> the Jews anticipate the arrival of Messiah. Guess when? Any day. Every day. This is why they pray. They're not, they're not interested that he, he'd come next week or next month or next year. They're praying that he would come today, like right now. Their prayers are full of requests to God to usher in the mess messianic era. Even the gates of, uh, we would say, even the gates of the gas chambers, right there, many 
of the Jews sang the Ani Moadim. Ani Moadim. I believe in what? In the coming of Mashiach. I want us to see this film before I continue. Um, this, is, this, this is part of, of the message here tonight. What did I just say? Even in, as they were going into the gas chambers, they were singing, I believe in the coming of Mashiach. Even if he delays, I will still know that he shall come. So the Jews are taught that there is a president, president time, a time that God alone knows when the Messiah is going to come. This is not a new thing. It is a new thing maybe with, with believers, but it comes from the Tanakh about the coming of the Messiah. How many are looking for his appearing? But they also believe that if we are meritorious, if we are merciful, if we are kind, if we do what is right, he may even come before that predestined time. He could come tonight. Hallelujah. And so, a further lesson I think that we may learn from the unusual form of the verb which expresses to bring back to bring back the exiles. The day on which the exiles will be gathered is so monumental, such a monumental in-gathering, which will be such a, such a difficult undertaking. We cannot even imagine how God has is, is been doing this because they've been coming from all over the world. How is it that you extract a Jew that has spent hundreds if not thousands of years in a certain part of the world and convince that person to come and to live in Israel. Listen, I want us to learn something here tonight. That it is as though God himself must literally take each individual Jew with his very hands and pluck him out of that place. Every Jew returning to Israel is therefore, I believe, literally handpicked by God himself. Who has scorched them personally into the land by his presence, by his spirit, just like when God took Ezekiel by the hand and said, I want you to walk down the river here. And the water was ankle deep, but he had the hand of Ezekiel in his hands. Listen here. Every Jew returning to Israel, literally, I say, is handpicked by the hand of God and escorted personally into the land with his presence by his spirit. Can you fathom that? Isaiah chapter 27 verse 12. God speaks to his people through the prophet Isaiah. And he says, and you will be gathered up one by one. So he picks them up. He hand picks them up one by one. Oh, children of Israel. That's where you get the understanding. That they're not just coming like, well, let's go and move to Israel. God is picking them one by one. Someone say, Amen. Amen. The call of the Jewish people was to spread the knowledge of God and to be a light unto the nations. And so the scriptures are filled with messianic quotes, starting in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 1. Moses prophesied that after the Jews have been scattered to the four corners of the earth, there will come a time when they will repent and they will return to the land of Israel, where they will fulfill all the commandments of the Torah and once again become a light to the nations. Amen. The Messiah will indeed undermine the unbelieving, proud lineage of Adam's third son. I want you to listen to this part. It's very important. 
Adam and Eve no longer had Abel and Cain, and God gave them another son by the name of what? Set or or Set or Set, and the Messiah is is going to do something because the the set all, all, although the Yeshua came from Seth himself and all the Jews came from Seth Seth who would choose there would be the descendants of Seth not all of them but some of the descendants of Seth would choose their own ways and their wisdom counting God's wisdom as foolishness Numbers 24, 17 to 20, verse 18 says, His enemies will be his possession. Edom and Sair possession. Israel will do valiantly. So Israel is going to succeed. Now in verse 20, God begins to deal in the end time with a, the spirit of Amalek. Say Amalek. What is this spirit? It says in verse 20, And he saw Amalek... And made this pronouncement. Watch this. First, Amalek was considered to be first among the nations because of its pride. Remember that pride comes before the fall. And so the, uh, the Amalekites, they, they were like a superpower. They believed that they were invincible. And so the word of God says that God will begin to deal in the end time with the spirit of Amalekite. And he saw Amalek and made this pronouncement. First among nations was Amalek, but destruction will be its end. Now, <clears throat> what is God saying here? The end of the Gentile rule is almost at hand. They have been first, as was Amalek, and destruction shall be their end. So now we're, we, this is what, March 20th. It's beginning, it's like, this is the end. God is bringing judgment to the nations. God is going to take away their cities and their vineyards. The Amalek was an uh, ancient uh, Middle Eastern nation that believed they were the best or better than all the other nations. This is the spirit of Amalek. They believed that they were better than all the other nations. They had an inborn, also an inborn hatred towards Israel like lots of people have today. Now why is it that people all over the world today, so many people hate the Jews? Well, they can't help hating the Jews. Why? Because of the spirit of hatred that's inside of them. This is the spirit of Amalek. They hated the Jewish people. They had a spirit of contention. They, they could not control that spirit of contention. Are you following me this far? Now, the Amalekites, they took any opportunity to attack the Jews. For absolutely no reason. And this is what's going on today. There was no land dispute or provocations and cause that caused them to, to hate the Jews. It was an intrinsic pathological need to hate. And to try to destroy God's people. And such hatred cannot be combated through diplomacy. Did you hear that? Such kind of hatred cannot be combated with diplomacy or trying to reason with a person who is contentious. All right. So you can't reason with hatred, in other words, right? If many people hate the Jews, how are you going to reason with them? You can't reason with, with hatred at all whatsoever. So, where does this bring us today? There was no option to re-educate the Amalekites. Like some would, are saying today, I think what we need to do is to re-educate those terrorists. Have you heard that? 
Yeah. If you re-educate them, then they will stop being terrorists. Let me just say this once again. You cannot. There is no way that you can negotiate or bring peace to someone that has hate inside of them. The man, I think the world has been cutting off the heads that you saw on television. You know, the guy that was cutting the heads of the innocent. Was he an ignorant man? No, he was a very highly educated man. Terrorists are not ignorant people. They know exactly what they're doing. They know how to make bombs. They know how to kill people. They know how to bring down the Twin Towers in New York. Are you following here? It's not that these people need education. Let's educate them and maybe this thing will turn around. I said there was no reviewing of the Amalekite school curriculum. Their hatred was, was, was not that they needed more teaching. It's that hatred was ingrained inside of them. And as long as an Amalekite walked on this earth, there was no Jew that was safe. Are you following here? It was clear case of kill or what? Be killed. And so this is why we read, it, we read in the scriptures where God is saying, you have to destroy the Malachites. So it is the same today as long as someone with an Amalekite spirit walks on the earth. There's no Jew or even Christians that are safe. 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse 2 and 3 the command here is to kill the Amalekite. Here is what Adonai Zevaot says. I remember what Amalekite did to Israel. How they fought against Israel when they were coming up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and completely destroy everything they have. Don't spare them. But kill men, women, and children, and babies, cows, sheep, and camels, and donkeys. Why? Because they are inbreded with hatred inside of them. Do you see that? So because of this, at that time, a Jew had to take the command to kill the Amalekite quite literally because his life depended upon it. Now, according to the scripture in Numbers 17, 20, Amalek is alive and well today, albeit in a different form than it was in that ancient time. Today's Amalek is an evil enemy of hatred that hates Israel with a passion in the same way that it did in ancient times. Hitler, for example, had what kind of spirit? Amalek's spirit. He had a spirit of hatred against the Jews and any race that did not meet his standard of greatness. So today, I think also any person that has anti-Semitism in their heart is a danger to Israel because they have an, what? an Amalek spirit of hatred against the people of God. Now, it's easy to say that these are all bad people, right? But anyone, I think, who demonstrates that they do not like you serving God also has an Amalek spirit. To be more precise, the inner Amalek is unholy. Cynicism. A spirit of gossip, for example, and slander. They're always gossiping and slandering Israel. You as a believer in Yeshua, have you faced the same? People mocking you because you're a believer, slandering you because you were a believer. Let me say this again. There is an Amalek spirit in America where Americans mock other Americans for being patriotic. Depending on God. Why are you depending on God? Or even favoring Israel. So, 
We must be very vigilant of our own lives and very, very careful because this spirit is a cynical spirit. When we doubt our own or others' efforts and sincerity, these are the modern day Amalekites. That the Messiah is going to deal with these Amalekites all around us because they wage a lethal war with our soul. Someone say amen. amen. So sometimes you just don't want to go to work because you're, someone's going to hit you with something, right? Yeah, they're going to say something against you. They're going to give you a, a kind of a bad look in your face because they are warring. This is the cynical spirit that wars against our soul. Are you following here tonight? That's why we must be very vigilant. We want to think the right way. They want to pull us another way. There's only been one way for the Jewish people. And if it's a good way, then we should follow the same way. So, I say for Beth Israel, JMI, we will not allow this kind of spirit to live within our midst. A cynical gossiping, slandering spirit has no place in the house of God. Someone say amen. So if we let it, cynicism can kill our every attempt to improve ourselves. You're trying to get ahead with God. You're trying to do the best. But the cynical spirit, this critical spirit, this, this uh, gossiping spirit is smothering any moves you're making to refine your life and your character and even trying to restore your soul to the highest level possible. Therefore, that spirit must die. Are you listening? God in the ancient times has killed that spirit. Kill those people. Every single one of them. Now, we're not to go and kill people today, but if someone has that spirit, that spirit must die. So there is only one effective response, I think, to modern-day Amalek's attacks to this spirit of hatred within the body of Yeshua especially and in the world, and that is this, annihilation. Did you get the word? Annihilation. And how do un you annihilate the spirit? Because we're talking about a spirit, right? How do you deal with the person that is a gossiper that's talking about bad about someone else? You don't want to kill them, but you have to kill that spirit. Yes. Oh. Annihilation. How do you do it? First of all, you never argue back. Amen. Say, I never argue back. Why? Because it won't work. It's inbreded inside of them. It's part of their character now. It's part of their system. They can't get rid of it, so it won't work if you argue back. The power of cynicism of someone who wants to argue is that it is irrational. You're dealing, you are dealing with an irrational person. They want to argue. They want to tell you bad reports. They want to tell you bad things. You are dealing with a person who is not reasonable, illogical, groundless, ba baseless. That person is unfounded, has no foundation, meaning that the person has no spiritual foundation. Yes, they might sing just like everybody else, but their foundation is no good. Are you listening here? You can't give such a person any kind of leading role. Their foundation is no good. You introduce them to friends, and pretty soon they're arguing with your friends that they just met for the first time. I, I, does this make sense? We see this happening all the time. You are dealing with a person who is not reasonable. And the most inspiring... The most uplifting and the most profound of spiritual awakenings that you may have been experiencing by hearing the word of God 
Being stirred by God can be dismissed in an instant by a Amalek spirit. That is sarcastic. That is, has cynicism in their lives. See, God taught his people this thousands of years ago. This is why you don't see this in Jewish congregations, but you see it in Christianity. Isn't that amazing that you see all of that going on in the church today? You can re recognize people with the Amalek spirit because they often take cheap pot shots. You know what that means, right? Taking a cheap pot shot at you is, uh, comes from a sarcastic spirit, the spirit of Amalek. And there is, no, there is no answer to cheap pot shots. You can't fight cynicism with what? With reason. You can't reason with them. You must then do what? You must remove that spirit. That spirit then must be removed because you cannot reason with it. It must be wiped out and Yeshua, guess what he's going to do? This is March 20th. This is why th th we're talking about what's going on right now. Judgment, right? Yeshua, our living Messiah. He is the one that will ultimately, he is the one that's going to wipe out what we are not Wiping out from the face of this earth. Why has it existed so long? We permitted it. We've allowed it. And people talk negative in front of you. And you don't say anything. And you feel really bad. You should have said something, right? I want you to turn to someone and say to them, Cynicism will not be allowed in my presence. From now on. So what are you going to do if it shows up? You're wiping it out from the face of the earth. All right? It's got to go. Mm -hmm. You know, the sad thing is that many people leave churches and leave congregations because we don't wipe it out. They go and the bad stays. So next time you feel like criticizing someone, it is an Amalek spirit that is rising his ugly head. What do you do then with your foot? You stomp on it. <laughs> where, does, where does the devil belong? Under your feet. You stomp on it. You realize that this is a spirit. You're not going to let that spirit Take over your climate and your atmosphere and your good time and your fellowship. Amen. Hallelujah. Now the word of God says to love your neighbor as yourself. Be kind without an explanation. Love your fellow man, woman without looking for a reward. Yes. Meaning love them in a way that it does not make sense. Mm -hmm. Someone says, why, why do you love that person so much? It doesn't make sense. Well, love them to the point that it doesn't make sense. <laughs> you love them so much that someone else looks at you and says, Man, why do you love that person so much? They're taking pot shots at you. Watch out. <laughs> Become the hero of your own inner battle. And free your captive soul. Hallelujah. I close with this thought tonight. Everyone who has ever worked in the United Nations does not have an excuse for hating Israel. You know why? Because right there, there's an interesting note that is in the wall of the United Nations that comes from Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6. And it says, And the wolf shall lie with a lamb. Hallelujah. And everyone say, Amen. Amen. I want you to know that it is God that's orchestrated the, these blood moons to appear at specific time during one of Israel's feasts to teach, I think, especially Christians to receive 
increased attention in the Christian community that God is with Israel. When Benjamin Netanyahu spoke before Congress, that was very evident, that God was not only with this leader of Israel, but that God is with Israel. And someone say, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let us stand together. Now you understand why we're, why we're having this May 20th phenomena, right? God is about to deal with all the cynicism and all the stuff that's been going on. Yeshua is going to come and deal with it. But we should do what we can until he comes. Amen. Hallelujah.